Namaste and greetings. I'm Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMSHI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, New Delhi. Extend my warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have on ethical challenges in clinical trials with a focus on drug and vaccine trials. This event is being organized by the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. I feel privileged to welcome the chair, Professor Ravi Vaswani. Sir has been working as a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Yenapona Medical College in Mangalore since 17 years. He has a special interest in infection diseases with a focus on HIV medicine and COVID-19. He has clinical and teaching experience of more than two decades. Besides this, Dr. Ravi Vaswani is also trained and teaches bioethics. Research ethics and clinical ethics. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mahima. I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amar Jisani. So is an independent researcher and teacher in bioethics and public health. He is a co-founder of the Forum for Medical Ethics Society and its journal, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, in which he has published and edited. He is a visiting professor at Yenapona University, Mangalore, the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Culture, Karachi, and Kenya Medical Research Institute, Nairobi. So is a member of the International Ethics Review Board of the Medicine Sans Frontiers and the National Ethics Committee for Stem Cell Research and Therapy of the Government of India. He has co-authored and co-edited nine books. Recently, he received the award for Bioethics Service in the Face of the Challenges 2021 by the International Association of Bioethics. Welcome, sir, and many congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are fortunate to have Dr. Dhwani Mehta, Professor Mala Ramanathan, Ms. Urvashi Prasad, and Advocate Veena Chohari as the discussants for the session. Dr. Mehta is a co-founder and lead head at Vidhi Center for Legal Policy, New Delhi. Welcome, ma'am. Professor Ramanathan is a professor at Chuth Achuta Menon Center for Health Studies, SCTI MST, Thiruvanthanampuram, and working editor, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. Welcome, ma'am. Ms. Prasad is the Director, Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office, Niti Aayog. Welcome, ma'am. And Advocate Chori is a lawyer at Courtyard Attorneys, Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am. Now, I would like to invite Professor Vaswani to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima. <clears throat> uh, it's clear and audible, right? Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, IMPRI and the organizers of this uh, panel discussion, as well as uh, keynote address for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. I'm honored and privileged. <clears throat> Instant coffee and ready to eat foods are now blase. The new mantra is super fast research, double quick research, results and instant cure. Expectations of all stakeholders are unrealistically high and there is a great demand and even greater pressure on the scientific community to deliver the goods now and here. The COVID-19 pandemic has only served to heighten these uh, requirements or demands. The earliest compromise that tends to occur in high pressure situations is on it. I can think of no better person than Amar Jasani to highlight these issues before us and throw some light on the way forward. Plus, it looks like it's going to be a very interesting discussion looking at the other discussions on the panel. <clears throat> uh, there are so many issues that can you know be discussed and come to mind, like triaging of trials in the pandemic and even before 
prioritization of COVID-19, neglecting non-COVID-19 studies, control human infection models, resource allocation, public health policy, access to healthcare, so many, it just goes on and on. So without much uh, ado and without taking much time, uh, I would like to move the program forward to the next stage and uh, request Dr. Amar Jasani to deliver his keynote address, following which uh, we will have the discussions coming in uh, with comments from their side. Over to you, Amar. Please unmute yourself, sir. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes, sir, you're audible. Uh, despite all, uh, you know, so many webinars, I, I keep struggling with the technology, sir. <laughs> Being old is the, is the major problem. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this invitation. And uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about clinical trial is not uh, uh, very new. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be knowing, but I don't know the the, the, the mix of the audience. So what I've done is uh, I have combined uh, certain basic things uh, with, uh, uh, with certain challenges and also try to you know, connect it to the, to the regulatory regime in India to the, what kind of laws are there. So this is a journal where uh, you'll find a lot of debate and discussion on uh, clinical trials. There is one of the topics that we cover, otherwise it is a a very broad-based journal in bioethics, healthcare, ethics, and uh, humanities. But uh, uh, since there are so many controversies in research ethics, it keeps coming up again and again. So these are the three major things that I'll do, you know, take up, uh, talk about what uh, clinical trials are in case some people don't know about it. But while doing it, I will uh, also highlight uh, some of the issues and then uh, look at the organizational structures and uh, the kind of laws and uh, uh, guidelines are available, and then go to the specific challenges. So let's start with what clinical trials are. You know, clinical trials, as you know, that it is the research to learn what works and what doesn't work. It is to find better ways to prevent, diagnose, or treat diseases, and they involve conducting experiments for human beings. When you say clinical trial, normally it is about the human trials. Um, do we need really clinical trials? There have been huge debates about that subject. Uh, it took long time, you know, in the history after the research started getting streamlined to come to a consensus that the experimental research is the, is the best one in order to find uh, unbiased evidence to show that something is working in response to a disease or not, or for the prevention of disease. So it became a gold standard. Today, when you say that this is the evidence from clinical trial, normally it doesn't get challenged. However, you know, there are a lot of other issues in the clinical trial itself that may lead to the validity, you know, debate on the validity of the evidence that has come. So more or less clinical trials are considered in this method to get, a, get the gold standard of the evidence. So that way, we'll start with that idea that they are indispensable and they need to be done. They cannot be stopped. But there can be a real debate about uh, do we need so many clinical trials? There have been a lot of... Uh, um, discussion and literature about the vestige in clinical trials. There are a large number of clinical trials which are not actually providing something radically new from what is already known. And there are some kind of a variation of the ex existing drugs and vaccines. And whether those kind of clinical trials should be done on the humans in order to, and, and, and expose them to the harm. So this is a uh, uh, this is an issue that keeps coming up. Another reason is that a uh, large number of clinical trial results don't get published. So people may be, you know, doing clinical trials of the same, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, same substances again and again. And I think that is another area that uh, is uh, hotly debated. So number of the clinical trial, how they can be capped uh, uh, under the control, I think is a very important area, but I haven't found so far any evidence that any regulator does it. On the contrary, most of the regulators and most of the countries believe that we need more and more clinical trials, not just more and more, but they have to be done faster and faster. And that's how most of the regulations are being diluted in order to, in order to speed up the clinical trial and have large number of clinical trials done. I don't believe that too many drugs can really lead to good public health situation. Too many drugs, you can keep drugging people and that is not going to in health of the people. America is the classical example. People are drugged like anything. Uh, but still, you'll find that uh, their uh, health status is, uh, is uh, not as uh, you know, great as uh, it should have been. So discovery process is, uh, is uh, at three levels that you can see. The first is basic research, which share a lot of public money goes. And as soon as you come to the you know, clinical research, you know, after the laboratory and animal testing, when you come to the clinical research, it is normally in the hands of the private sector. In countries like US, it is, it is by norm, it is private sector. It is handed over to the private sector. While uh, in India, oftentimes public institutions get uh, involved, but that number is declining with the, with the government having more focus on the on, on the private sector. So what happens is that there is a lot of investment of the public. And at the end, it is the private sector that gets the, gets the um, uh, you know, patent for the drug and uh, makes the money. I think that is one area which uh, again needs to be looked at, that how do you account for the public uh, uh, investment in that? So the testing of human beings is done in, the, in, in four phases. And uh, this is a, a highly regulated process simply because the animal testing and the human testing. There is a there are animal ethics committee and there is a regulation there. But in the human uh, one, the uh, potential to harm and exploitation is very, very high. And so they are closely and actively regulated. There are specific laws and establishment of the expert regulatory agency like uh, FDA in India, the CDSC are there at the national level. And at the local level, there are ethics committees of the institutions which are supposed to take care of it. The phase one clinical trial is the, is the, is the most challenging simply because we are using the new drug for the first time on the people. And uh, the history is also very controversial because large number of prisoners and vulnerable people were used uh, in order to do the first phase of clinical trial. Now it is not allowed. Prisoners and other vulnerable are not allowed, but uh, they do pay a lot of money. And uh, so payment to the participants in the phase one clinical trial, when they are testing the drugs for the first time is a, is a major uh, issue. Here they uh, do um, uh, small numbers and they use uh, normally healthy volunteers, except in some cases like cancer, chemotherapy and all, where the patients are used because uh, the, 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 the potential harm is quite high. Here the major ethical issue that comes up and where uh, we need more intervention of the regulatory bodies in India is that uh, there should be very strict standard about uh, the clinical trial site where the phase one clinical trials are carried out. I've seen phase one clinical trials being done in, the, in, in a hospital setting. We do not have excellent emergency and intensive care facility and multidisciplinary support system. I've also seen a lot of protocols where uh, uh, the, the intensivists and the other uh, emergency physicians were required in order to save the patient if something goes Save the, save the participant if something goes wrong. They are not made co you know, investigators in the, in, in the proposal. So I think uh, there is a, some, some uh, work cut out for the policymakers to see that those things are very clearly defined and uh, they are uh, accredited and uh, 
there has is registration of the institutions where uh, phase one clinical trials carried out. If you see the COVID uh, vaccine clinical trials in India, the phase one clinical trials were carried out in the institution, which were not so often involved in doing similar kind of phase one clinical trials. So in the name of uh, uh, you know, the emergency, certain kind of institutions were used where I found uh, that uh, they did not have a, a, a long track record of doing this kind of study. Phase two is to find out, first attempt to find out whether things work or not. You have a few hundred participants. If you are having a, a, a prevention, then you see whether uh, the, vaccine, the vaccine is producing you know, immunogenicity or not. So it also looks at certain doses systems and uh, and here it is a uh, it is a it is a small number of participants and uh, but they are not followed up for a long time but what what we find out is that yes does this drug work does it it went to certain extent does it uh, you know produces a reaction in body which will uh, ensure that uh, uh, there is an immunity against the disease so those are the things which are looked at in the phase two clinical trial. Phase three is the most important, which is also called confirmatory trial. It confirms the findings of the first phase where you say that, well, there is a not very remarkable uh, um, safety issue. Then uh, does it happen in the same way in a large number of cases? Same way, you are trying to find out whether uh, uh, when you say that uh, in the phase two, that it does works, does it work in large number of participants? Not just large number, but the participants coming from different kind of locations and uh, different social and ethnic background and context. That's how the multicentric trials are considered to be more heterogeneous, producing more heterogeneity, bringing uh, people from uh, different backgrounds in the trial and that way, providing us uh, a better understanding of how it works in different people. It has a desk experimental design where uh, there is an experimental arm where the, and there is a control arm. And then there's a lot of blinding done that patients do not know what they are getting. And, they, and even the doctors who are doing it, they do not know what, uh, what uh, you know, uh, uh, who is getting what. So the place, either it is compared with the standard treatment or with the placebo. Placebo is supposed to be used only when there is no, um, no, um, remedy available. Now, that's how the future vaccine trials on, on, on COVID will not have a placebo control. And I think uh, um, Indian uh, office guidelines are very clear on that, which says that uh, you will have to use the standard. That is one of the existing uh, vaccine in the control arm. Uh, it releases data on the efficacy and the side effects and uh, that way we also have to ensure that the uh, trial continues for the long enough time in order to generate those kind of data. This is the fourth phase of the clinical trial. Once you have phase three, you go to the drug regulator and ask for the marketing approval. Once the marketing approval is there, then the fourth phase starts. Now, what is happening nowadays is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you know, under the emergency rules, without having phase three, the, the, the uh, drug is given approval. It happened in the, in the therapeutic uh, component of the COVID drugs and uh, uh, certain drugs were given approval. But that requires a very strong pharmacovigilance, post-marketing surveillance. Part of the post-marketing surveillance is voluntary where the practitioners and institutions voluntarily report uh, the problems faced by the patient. In India, the data shows that it is not much. So there is a network of the centers of the pharmacovigilance. They try to actively collect data, but how good they are in India, I think, and who are monitoring them and to what extent the drug regulator is uh, setting standards there is uh, very, very important. And how these data are made available to the, to, 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 to the people in India, in the public domain. Normally, the data are not available in the public domain. And so it is very, very difficult. 
it's, it's, it's very clear that there is underestimates of reporting uh, when the reporting is voluntary. All drugs are followed up for four years and the vaccine and others are followed up for, 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 for all the time. They also carry out certain specific studies that is called active pharmacovigilance. And uh, there uh, you may have uh, a better uh, data output and the papers may be available. Let's go to the organizations of the clinical trial. Clinical trials have become international and the developed countries are uh, outsourcing the clinical trials to, to the developing countries. So in the process of doing it, they also break down the procedure of doing research into various components. And each component is, uh, is implemented by different companies that for contract research organization. And that's uh, uh, very, very, very problematic. When you have too many players, it is very difficult to coordinate all of them for a, for, for, for a regulator. And that's how there was a debate earlier about the Indian regulation saying that should the contract research organization be given a status of sponsor or should we, you know, as a, as a, as a country, recognize only the primary sponsor, which is a pharmaceutical company. It's very, very important because there are too many of them and uh, they do all kind of uh, uh, for, 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 for tasks of the research. The sponsor and pharma, uh, sponsor these pharma companies create assemblage of such contractors who mediate with the investigators and participants and uh, appropriate the outcome. So what is happening here is that the investigators who are at the at the level where the patients are recruited, they are actually the, the, the very glorified data collector. They say in the actual clinical trial is very, very limited. Even designing of the clinical trials is normally done uh, at the level of the center where, uh, uh, where the sponsor is located and not the uh, direct involvement of uh, the, the, the investigator who ultimately accepts to, to become investigator at the, at the hospital level. So this knowledge production that happens to data collection uh, from below is appropriated by the larger entity called, uh, called uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical company. And in the international clinical trial, so there is, there is an appropriation of knowledge because what is ultimate, what, what was collected from India if it is not uh, in a good sample size, oftentimes you are not able to do a separate uh, analysis of it. And oftentimes there is no contract where it says that the Indian um, you know, investigators have a right to do that. And that, again, there will be several uh, hospitals involved in multi trials from India where uh, you know, there is a need for bringing together all those investigators and looking at the data collectively. That hardly, rarely happens. And there is a you know, push to doing a clinical trials quick and cheap. This whole uh, uh, putting our system or uh, outsourcing system is for the cheapness of the trial as well as fitness of the trial. In India, people don't uh, uh, get uh, you know, treatment when they are sick to that extent as they do in the developed countries. And that's how in developed country, when you are going to the patient, they are not treatment night. They are only on the treatment. And so there has to be, you know, a washing period of the old drugs before they are taken on the clinical trial. And since they get the standard treatment, they're not so ready to participate in the clinical trial as some country, some country, country like India where people you know, don't have uh, enough uh, um, uh, treatment available. And that's how there is a compulsion. There's a push factor which leads to that. The CROs are actually, in a way, uh, highly under the control of, uh, of the pharmaceutical company. And uh, therefore, uh, there are uh, many instances of their bending the ethical standard. These are the laws. They are the, I'm not going to go into details, but I just kept them in order to uh, tell you that uh, it internationally, we started with the Nuremberg Code after the Second World War and, uh, and, and all the ethics violation in the, in the Nazi Germany. 
and then Helsinki guidelines, yeah, I mean, WHO has had in their own thing. And then pharmaceutical companies have created international conference on live hormonization. And the WHO is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the World Trade Organization is also involved in the intellectual property hedging. This is the law in India, which was uh, enacted in 1945. And, uh, and uh, now it is, I believe that uh, Currently, the Drugs and Cosmetic Act is being rewritten. So hopefully, we'll have more information about what the government is planning. But I hope they are not going to deregulate that much. And these are the, yeah. Hello. Anyway, let's come to the, let's come to the ethics and uh, there are uh, two issues here. The role of ethics is normally to protect and research ethics participants. And so it is very, very important that the ethical, the ethics regulations are geared to the patient and the participants and not to the facilitation of the researchers and the, and the companies. So there's first thing is for clinical equipoise is that uh, you cannot do clinical uh, you know, trials if you do not have a doubt about uh, how good the new drug is as compared to the current available therapy. So there has to be a genuine, you know, objective existence of what we call equipoise, where you are not sure how well it works as compared to the current one. It is, if it, that's how the, the whole issue about, uh, uh, about um, uh, you know, use of placebo and all is located there. The second is a therapeutic misconception. You might have heard about it simply because the patients who are recruited in the clinical trial are under the treatment of a physician or in the public health research where the public health authority is combining with the clinical trial. People trust research and people trust the, you know, doctors and the public health authority and they believe that uh, they must have given you know, permission for this kind of clinical research in the best interest of theirs. And that's how oftentimes they get a misconception as if they are not in research, but they are being provided treatment in their best interest. While experiments are experiments, there are uh, uncertainties in the experiment. We don't know whether it, the drug will succeed or not. Not succeeding means either it is not effective or, uh, or efficacious or uh, it is uh, having a high amount of uh, potential harm. So either way, the patient could lose out, but they don't understand that. And that happens when uh, people who, whom they trust, they are the ones who are recruiting them. That is, the, my doctor is uh, asking me to join clinical trial. Then I'm more likely not to pay attention to, to, the, to the aspects of the clinical trial that I should have paid attention to. So the consent should be taken by somebody. The doctor who is in charge for the clinical, uh, clinical care of the patient should normally not be the investigator. But these are the things that are still not, uh, uh, not uh, part of our uh, regulation. It is not even part of ICMR guidelines. Recruitment should be done to the public notice rather than being done to the individual doctors because there the, the, the therapeutic misconception is very high. Informed consent, all of you know about, but the most important issue that, that I want to raise is that there may not be direct physical compulsion, but there may be structural compulsion. You all know about the Paul Farmer who recently died. He wrote a lot about the structural violence and, 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 and structural compulsions people have. I was also talking about earlier saying that if people are not able to get treatment, the standard treatment, they would like to join clinical trial because they will get it free of charge. That means there is a push factor and that is the structural push factor. You cannot assume that uh, they are really voluntarily coming. And I think that is one of the reasons why the clinical trials are coming to developing countries where the universal access to healthcare is not there. So one can ask this question that is there a genuine consent possible in the clinical trial without access to the standard care? 
in the sense that we should ask that if India does not go for the universal access to healthcare services for the people, the large number of the clinical trials, will they be actually exploiting the people and uh, where uh, the consent may not be as voluntary as, as, as it is made out to be? Coming to the adverse events, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, what uh, are the definitions. I'm not going to go into that, but it could be death, it could be life threatening situation, it could be hospitalization or prolongation of the hospitalization or the congenital anomalies and birth defects, all kinds of stuff which are. Adverse events. And uh, no, uh, the criteria that is used. As I said, that the uh, most important part is uh, about uh, who judges. There was a big debate on, on this in India, and ultimately the Indian law has made attempt to have assessment not by the company appointed committee, but by the independent committee. And then it is connected to the uh, the the compensation. If uh, uh, the problem is uh, injury caused by, 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 by the clinical time. However, in the entire process, the expert decide about the experts, whether there was a, you know, uh, 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 you know, any kind of, uh, um, uh, any, any kind of, uh, serious adverse event, we notice that ethics committee normally don't talk to the patient or patient's relatives. You know, before formulating the viewpoint and sending it to the drug regulator, saying that this is what is their evidence about the, the relatedness of the event. I think this is a, a fairly, well, this, this is highly unfair to the patient because Without the voice, if, if, if it is about me, I, or I, I, if I am available, and all, all my all people who are uh, deciding on my fate, because I am injured, I am having disability, or I am dead. And that is where I think uh, this uh, current uh, regulation are ethically not justified. They need to be, I you know, um, broaden with the inclusion and participation of the, particip of, of the participants representatives. The other part is ancillary care. That if I'm under, if I'm in the clinical trial say for for uh, cancer and I suffer from uh, malaria, supposed to provide me full care for it. That means any any trial, they are supposed to take care of me, but. Uh, I still haven't got any data, any information in India to what extent this is a, this is a, um, uh, a you know, you know, practice. Although Indian Council of Medical Research guidelines confirms to it, the Indian law does not. I hope when they revise the Indian law, they will, uh, uh, ex uh, they will include it. Now, these are the last couple of slides. This is first one is uh, what happens, what we call post-trial excess. What is found is that the large number of clinical trials which are carried out in the developing countries, they are not marketed in that country. And if they are marketed, they are not marketed at the price that people can afford. So this is a major problem. New clinical trial rules of 2019, they are saying that uh, if uh, investigators propose it, then the patients who are on the clinical trial after the clinical trial gets over, may get, may be provided if certain conditions are met, those, uh, you know, new drug free of cost. However, how long there has to be a negotiation. And, uh, but uh, still uh, there is uh, absolutely no guidance and no law about uh, uh, how this drug will be marketed. Will it be marketed in India at all where the subjects were used? And uh, will it be marketed at the prices at which is affordable? Will there be, if a clinical trial is done, conducted in India, will there be compulsory license for, for, for the new drug that comes out? This is about transparency at every stage, phase one clinical trial to two, three, four, you know, all of these phases and uh, for the marketing approval. 
there is a drug regulator in war and they have subject expert committee. Their conflict of interest disclosure is never made public. It is a disclosure within the regulatory framework. Nobody comes to know who are these members of the subject expert committee who took decision and uh, what was the conflict of interest. Even judges, when there is a conflict of interest, they recuse from, from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, doing, uh, do, doing the job on that, that particular case. Here, we don't have any information how many of the experts are actually barred from uh, participating as an expert in a clinical trial uh, appro approval if uh, they have conflict of interest. Minutes are written like shorthand decisions. We don't come to know what were the views of the experts. Experts are supposed to provide the, in writing the review comment, but that is not uh, ever, ever in the public domain. And that is a major problem that how does the regulator function is, uh, is, uh, is not known. The last thing, but most important is that when uh, authorization or the approval to, for a drug is provided, where are the data? If data are seen only by the regulator and only by the experts uh, that will sit on the, uh, on the subject expert committee, then they were made public. Why it is so? I mean, what is, what is, what is the trade secret in it? There is absolutely not. US and Europe have come out with laws which make it mandatory for the, for the availability of clinical trial reports, which contain huge amount of data. It is not sufficient to publish an article in a medical journal, which is a different issue because there also, as I say, that there is a crisis of credibility of the papers uh, based on the clinical trial published in medical journal because large number of them are gross returns. They are actually done by the, to the, to the money of the pharmaceutical company. So there should be clinical trial reports made available, but there are, I mean, even in the Western countries where the standards are high, they are also trying, you know, for pharmaceutical companies and the politicians and regulators are trying to reduce the excess. But at least there is a law there which says that uh, it should be made available and that's how people are able to fight. And there have been some access to the data there. In India, that is not there at all. And I hope uh, in coming time, something will be done about it. So I have done 30 minutes. I'll stop here. There are uh, certain specific issues. Uh, I, I know that uh, um, controlled human infection trial is a, is, is, but it's, it's, it's a subject in itself. I, I, I didn't want to cover it uh, here. There are also a lot of issues related to vulnerability of the population. What are the different vulnerabilities? I'm, I'm told that uh, Mala Ramnathan, who is here, she is going to talk about the gender issues in the clinical trial. So there will be one part of it will be covered. But then there are also other vulnerabilities uh, in, the, in the clinical trial. When the questions come, others will take them up. But uh, my main uh, task was to cull out uh, from the ethical challenges, as I had seen in the clinical trial, cull out certain policy issues, you know, which can be debated and hopefully taken forward with the policymakers and uh, we can have a law and regulation which are better than what we have now. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to the comments of, uh, of uh, our, uh, uh, our panelists and, uh, and uh, the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amar. As usual, very lucid, very succinct, and very frank. All of us who know Amar know that he speaks to stimulate our intellect, to question our beliefs, and to shape our conventional notion of truth and wisdom. <clears throat> he very rightly pointed out that <clears throat> physicians wear multiple hats, and this often creates misunderstandings in research. <clears throat> um, uh, he said that there's an Indian law regarding um, assessment of uh, causality, but uh, somehow I find that it doesn't reflect in <clears throat> what we see in the clinical trials that we are reviewing at our ethics committee levels. <clears throat> Sometimes the PI may say that there is a possibility of the causality, but the sponsor clearly says no causality. I mean, uh, it's, it's, we never see any independent uh, committee coming in. So I'm not sure whether it's really at the grassroots level translated into action uh, by the uh, clinical trial uh, people. And post-trial access definitely continues to remain dismally low. Um, 
I would like to invite the other discussants into uh, the discussion here at this point <clears throat> and um, welcome any comments from them. Dwani Mehta, would you like to start? Can you unmute? Sure, sure. Yeah. sure, Professor Vaswani. I'm happy to uh, go first. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jisani. That was a really wonderful exposition of the history of clinical trials and their regulation in India, as well as some of the key challenges that uh, have arisen uh, as far as the Indian context goes. Um, I've had, you know, when you, there was something in your slide about, you know, uh, obviously when you were talking about the vulnerability of participants in clinical trials. And I was just reminded of the time that I was studying at a university in, in the UK and was very excited by the prospect of earning 2000 pounds uh, to be a part of a trial on uh, malaria um, that would, uh, you know, that would give me, uh, that would cover a lot of my living expenses for that term. And, uh, you know, I, uh, other people were shocked at the thought that I'd want to be part of a, 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 a drug trial on malaria. And I, and I, on the other hand, was bitterly disappointed that I was ineligible because I'd already had malaria in the past. Uh, but that, I mean, that, that was my first sort of experience with thinking about how uh, there are so many factors that influence how people agree to participate, uh, you know, in clinical trials. And how one draws a fine line between ensuring that they are compensated for their time appropriately and at the same time ensuring that this doesn't act as an undue uh, incentive. So that's that, that's always stayed with me. And I've since had the privilege to sort of move from being a potential participant in a clinical trial to uh, now, you know, a member of ethics committees of, you know, uh, I used to be part of an ethics committee at KM Hospital in Mumbai and now I'm part of the ICMR Central Ethics Committee on Research, as well as the Forum for Medical Research. And while my understanding has grown and I now perhaps have a better grasp of some of these ethical issues, I still feel that there is uh, so much more that needs to be done as far as building capacity amongst ethics committees go. So, you know, I now have, I, I have the opportunity to be a part of ethics committees where members are very well acquainted with these issues, uh, you know, are very well, are very knowledgeable, are well versed in developments around the world, can bring a very unique insight to, to these meetings. And I, I still feel that, you know, despite all this education, training, knowledge, uh, it, 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 some of the ethical issues that arise are just very difficult to grasp with. And most importantly, I mean, as a lawyer, it's sometimes very difficult to engage with the, the technical subject matter of some of the questions that we are discussing. So, you know, I would like to be able to, to contribute better, but I sometimes feel hamstrung by my inability to speak the language that uh, proposals are written in, uh, you know, and then I, I'm, I'm reduced to sort of giving my comments on the informed consent form and the sort of agreements between sponsors and, uh, 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 principal investigators and I feel like there's I mean I suppose this is a much more fundamental issue about how we as you know as a society communicate across disciplines or speak in a transdisciplinary way and I I find that ethics committees could be a real crucible for that uh, but sometimes struggle to you know ensure that 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 dif those different kinds of knowledge are are exchanged appropriately and 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 then accordingly you know the right decision is taken to protect uh, uh, trial participants so i feel when we're discussing ethical challenges today in the conduct of clinical trials in india this the institutional role that ethics committees play is a very important one i mean the new drugs and clinical trials rules have really uh, created, I mean, have made ethics committees the, the pillar of uh, clinical trial oversight uh, in the country. And un until we sort of get uh, that right, you know, we, we won't be, there won't be enough trust in how our clinical trials are conducted. So, you know, the, the regulatory uh, framework is one, but the sort of training and capacity building of the committees themselves is obviously another crucial one. Um, 
the other, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure what form my comments should take during this uh, discussion, but I, the other, just the other experience that I wanted to share that I thought was, uh, you know, particularly challenging during the pandemic was the regulatory approval that was granted to Covaxin and Covishield, obviously, you know, on the basis of uh, limited uh, trial data. Um, and what some of the, uh, sorry, just give me a minute. Am I am I audible to, to you clearly? Because yes. I seem to be getting yes, some. Yes, you are. Okay, great, great. Um, so the, um, the regulatory approval that was granted to Covaxin and Covishield on the basis of limited clinical trial data um, and the condition that was attached to the emergency use authorization for both these vaccines, i.e. Uh, the use in restricted emergency use in the public interest under clinical trial mode. Um, and then that phrase under clinical trial mode was obviously one that uh, puzzled both, um, I mean, you know, the ethics committees themselves as well as, I'm not entirely sure if the regulator themselves were clear about what, what, what that was supposed to mean. And uh, again, that sort of emphasized what, uh, you know, the, the, the burden of responsibility that was placed on the ethics committee. So, you know, again, in the interests of disclosure, I was part of the ICMR ethics committee that was asked to approve the, uh, you know, the, the, to which the proposal on the rollout of Covaxin during uh, India's vaccination drive came. And uh, we really struggled to understand what um, what clinical, you know, to, to be able to define what clinical trial mode means. And uh, if it does, what are the kinds of uh, protections that have or, that ought to have been in place while rolling out that the vaccine uh, across the country? And I mean, that, that brings me to the other broader general point that I wanted to make, which is that we, despite having, uh, you know, a new, a relatively new regime on uh, clinical trial regulation, at least with the 2019 rules, we still have a very weak overarching uh, parent legislative architecture as far as uh, drugs and cosmetics and uh, clinical trial regulation goes. And it's because that, 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 that parent legislation doesn't have overarching principles, it doesn't have guarantee uh, certain rights, doesn't grant the regulator certain powers to penalize erring companies or, or manufacturers. That is why, you know, it's sort of when your foundation is weak, no matter what, you know, sophisticated superstructures you're able to build on it, uh, they're always going to be uh, wobbly because you haven't got the basics right. So I, I think the pandemic sort of showed up what some of these gaps were and and, and the specific example, example that I wanted to talk about was the kind of emergency use authorization of these vaccines that we saw, which, you know, obviously all ultimately went into sort of uh, diminishing the public trust in, in the vaccines, in the regulatory pro uh, process that, uh, you know, guaranteed their safety and efficacy and that obviously had, uh, you know, a domino effect on on public health itself. So, I think when we think about um, ethical challenges in clinical trial regulation, it's also important to keep in mind that there's also a glaring legal loophole as far as uh, you know the parent legal architecture for clinical trial regulation is concerned. And I know that there are talks amongst the government about uh, creating a new Drugs and Cosmetics Act, but Currently, that process is not transparent. It doesn't seem to be inclusive, and we don't know what what shape it's going to take. So I'm glad we're having this discussion today because maybe some of this can, you know, uh, at some point of time, ultimately inform uh, the legislative exercise that's planned. So I'll stop there, and of course, happy to participate in the discussion uh, and engage with the other panelists as we progress. Thank you. Thank you, Dhani. What we'll do is we'll run through a round of all the other discussions sure. and then uh, take it up. So sure. uh, I would next invite uh, Mala. Is Mala here? Yeah. Yeah, Mala. Yeah, I'm very much there. And uh, the floor is yours. I am going to try to share some slides which are going to help me to, you know, rush through what I want to say very quickly. So.
Is it visible? Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes, it's visible. So, my disclaimer, as is usual, the opinions present expressed are the, my own, and I'm co-authoring or made these remarks are jointly with my PhD student, who is a pharmacologist, ethicist, lawyer, or a little bit of training in law. So they are our own and not those of the institutions to which we are affiliated. It's very, very important to look at the departure with regard to women's participation in clinical trials. And that comes from the very limited inclusion for a very long time, close to almost 50 years now, which is a legacy of the thalidomide and the death disasters that happened, which resulted in enhanced risk for women and their children and their subsequent you know, challenges, legal challenges in courts and the payouts by pharmaceutical companies, which therefore, you know, brought about a very strong paternalistic perspective with regard to women and particularly pregnant women and lactating women in uh, participating in clinical trials. So it resulted in limited inclusion of women and almost never for pregnant women, because of course, there is the risk of, you know, the risk to the fetus and the subsequent children born. And that became a generic reason for excluding pregnant women. Therefore, even though women don't participate extensively in clinical trials, the evidence created through clinical trials is used on women for treating them. Biologically, women are different entities. Any clinician will tell you. They have a different hormonal milieu, different cellular and humoral, humoral immune, immunity response as COVID has just now shown for vac vaccines and viral infections. And their exclusion of pregnant women means treatment options for them are very limited. That is tested and proven. It's not that women don't get sick. Pregnant women do get infections. They may be vulnerable to most of the things that non-pregnant people are also vulnerable to, but our treatment options for them have never been tested for them. So we are kind of, you know, they're getting treated in a, you know, experience basis and not on research basis. So exclusion of women, especially pregnant and lactating women has become a default option, not a evidence-based one. But the global regulations are changing. Way back in 93, the USA NIH Revitalization Act called for including women and minorities in clinical trials. It wasn't so rigorously implemented, but it called for. The Federal Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007 defined something called applicable clinical trials, which expanded the scope of regulations. And then the 21st Century Cures Act requires entities to submit valid analysis by sex, gender, and race, and ethnicity to clinicaltrials.gov. That is where you submit your proposed studies, et cetera. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists guidance requires pregnant women to not to be treated as vulnerable subjects, but as scientifically complex subjects because of the ethical and physiological complexities. And it also required post-marketing marketing surveillance to monitor long-term effects, particularly on uh, women and pregnant women. In European Commission, you have a similar requirement. It re requires that people recognize sex differentials and outcomes, describe sex and gender-based analysis, and design specific studies for subgroups wherever relevant, such as pregnant and lactating. And it asks for including a specific gender dimension and says that when it evaluates funding options for such research, it would go under a criteria for excellence, meaning that it gives it an edge over other studies which don't do that. Same thing for Canadian Institute. They ask for integrating and there it has moved one step forward than most other things. It asks the question, does the proposal integrate sex as a variable? Does the proposal integrate gender as a sociocultural determinant of health? But if you look at published materials, what do we have? The sex and gender equity in research has developed the SAGER guidance to distinguish between sex and gender and explain the requirements. However, this is 2016. You would think 
something would have happened after that and the covid response would have been you know oh we have sage guidelines no sex and gender are continue to be used intergenderly interchangeably globally particularly us based vaccine trials at least included equal number of men and women because it had become something which fda was asking questions about but on other progress outcomes by sex are lagging behind in spite of the growing evidence on differential immune response for men and women differential rates of serious adverse events differential mortality rates after vaccination all of this regardless the data segregated by something like sex is not available in indian context we just looked at ongoing 12 trials international guidelines require including pregnant and breastfeeding women after careful consideration of data available from preclinical research in pregnant animal models or research on non pregnant women or retrospective observational studies or pregnancy registers women have been included in covid vaccine trials but had to use contraceptives to prevent pregnancies the breakup of participants by sex is not reported serious adverse events by sex is not available there are serious adverse events after a lot of effort are getting reported the rationale for excluding pregnant or lactating women or justification for use of contraceptives is not provided in the documentation but we have to mention it is not a regulatory requirement either so why would they feel compelled because somebody you know some global seoms regulation ask for icmr regulations women participants must be provided with the option to use effective contraceptive methods and be told about op- options available for failure for this is the icmr meaning that it is paternalistic and goes back whereas international regulations call for re- respecting autonomy and providing information and leaving women to make a choice maybe this is india and women don't make choice but this is our regulation 2017 after seoms came up in 2016 women who become pregnant must not automatically be removed this is a very important thing from the study where there is no evidence showing potential harm to fetus review the situation and offer option to withdraw or continue and monitor pregnant women participants for those who want to continue new drugs and clinical trials rules pregnant or nursing women should be included in clinical trials when the drug is intended for use by pregnant or nursing women vaccine you know women do get positive covid pregnant or otherwise so vaccine must be useful for them but we are asking women to not to get pregnant at all and when the data is generated from women who are not pregnant or nursing is not suitable so what is the indian regulations and the potential implications for vaccine trials paternalism very visible contrary to international regulations and guidance with respect to women particularly pregnant and lactating women especially pregnant women are still designated as vulnerable population and you know this is for want of a better word outdated in the international context we don't call them vulnerable the scientific requirement is to look at them as you know complex mechanism you know requirement for complex interventions but not this way india is one of the few countries actually providing data on ban- vaccine acceptance by non binary non binary categories that is but the data because they are reporting it by absolute numbers you cannot even get the transgenders to be a blip on that pi diagram and we don't have a regulatory requirement that could be a deterrent but this absence results in excluding pregnant and lactating women routinely from being part of evidence building and the effect is delay in developing guidance for women in general and pregnant ones in particular regulations i think should include trial submissions to regulators to justify exclusion of women or pregnant women and lactating women in keeping with international regulations reporting on trial data even on regulatory submissions to ctri should provide information on the planned sex at least sex disaggregated analysis as part of routine process and exclusion should not be you know default mode 
journals should require sex and gender analysis or verify adherence to SAGE guidelines as part of essential requirement for evidence building, particularly for new drugs and vaccines. We should actually encourage reanalysis of existing data from clinical trials to see if we can generate some evidence for women pregnant or otherwise in order you know, that we can at least validate what is being found clinically. So this is my short presentation. Hopefully it was sufficiently short on the need for gender and uh, that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mala. Uh, we can move on to uh, the next speaker, the next discussant, uh, Urushi Prasad. Sir, ma'am has not been able to join due to some meeting. Okay, shall we move on to Veena? Is anybody else stepping in place of Urushi? Uh, not yet, sir. I will inform you. We can okay. go to advocate Veena, ma'am. Yeah, Veena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, on this August panel uh, of and a very important uh, uh, topic indeed, uh, especially in this COVID era. I would like to take it from, um, you know, Amar's last slide, which spoke about that the participant uh, is not really anywhere, uh, even though the participant takes the maximum risk, uh, what is given to the participant is the least amount in the entire, uh, in, among all the stakeholders uh, in a clinical trial setup. And uh, this largely, happens is because we are not looking at health as a human rights issue. Health and human rights are so intrinsically linked. And unfortunately, the lawmakers, the, uh, the people who are making the guidelines are unable to see it in that manner. And so the participant is just there. And they are, in fact, in our law, they are called subjects. They are not called participants. The moment you call them a participant, they will be at an almost equal level as you are, as the researcher is, or as the sponsor is. But they are treated as subjects, and uh, the entire clinical trial process actually looks at them that way, including, as Amar very rightly pointed out, uh, the assessment of the injury or the clinical trial injury that takes place. What happens when an injury takes place? It is the uh, the PI who will who will make a record of everything and will submit it to the uh, ethics committee. The ethics committee, based on what the principal investigator has given them, will make an assessment on whether the uh, injury was related to the uh, to the trial drug or not. And you know this is the uh, a very sad fallout of what has happened to the law. Earlier, when, when the provision of compensation or uh, even assessment was introduced into the law, they had put in a clause that said, injury relating to the clinical trial. And subsequently, they changed it. And it, clinical trial would mean a lot of things in the clinical trial. But subsequently, they changed it to whether it is related to the drug or not, or to the vaccine or not. And so that causality assessment needs to be taken. And these are very difficult assessments to do. You can never be 100% sure. So why should you not give the benefit of doubt to the, to the weaker participant? And the participant is the weaker person in this entire uh, system of clinical trials. So why, should, why do you need to do all these things where in majority, I would say 99.9% .9 of the times it just comes as not related, not related. Sometimes it is related, but it is managed just by, uh, you know, uh, medical care. Okay. So these are issues in the law itself where the law is not looking at it from a rights perspective. And the moment you change that perspective, you can change a lot of things that are that all this paternalism that Mala spoke about. All that can go only when we change things in a, an appropriate manner. Now, uh, just talking about this, uh, it's an important thing uh, we should make note of that when uh, the regulator, and especially for clinical trials for drugs and vaccines, it is the regulator who has to give approval. The DCGI uh, gives approval, uh, you know, and only then 
uh, the the site where the clinical trial is taking place can even begin the uh, can begin the trial. Now, interestingly, just in January uh, of this year, the DCGI has uh, come out with a notification, and they are proposing to amend the rules to call for deemed approval. So they want to give deemed approval to ethics committees who, and uh, as of now, all ethics committees need to be registered, okay? So what the new clinical trial uh, and drug regulation did was they created two kinds of ethics committees. They created one which is looking at clinical trials, which would be uh, drugs, vaccines, uh, BA, uh, you know, uh, bioavailability and bio uh, BAB uh, trials. And the other ethics committee, which will look at what they call and they define as the BMHR trials, that is the uh, uh, biomedical uh, health related trials. So they are mainly, uh, you know, your basic science trials, etc. Now, both these committees need to be registered compulsorily or mandatorily under the law. But what happened is they are coming out with this proposal. It has thankfully not yet been passed as law where they will give ethics committee approval, uh, you know, without, um, uh, what do you say? Uh, they, are, they, they say if we do not reply back in 60 days or 90 days or whatever it is, you consider it as deemed approval. So that is for ethics committees, for drug trials, for uh, vaccine trials, for all kinds of clinical trials, um, uh, for all kinds of BABA studies, uh, for phase one to phase four, all kinds of studies. Now, this is, uh, this is just such a ridiculous thing that if you bring in deemed approvals, uh, it gives a message that the drug controller has not done the due diligence. You have to look at who are the people sitting in these ethics committees who are looking, are they well qualified or not? What are the proposals? What is the design of the trial? Uh, what kind of drugs uh, trials are going to take place? And if you go in for deemed approval, you are actually encouraging unethical and illegal trials to take place, which can be approved by any committee, which will get deemed approval. You are looking at, as, uh, you know, Amar pointed out the phase one, phase two, phase three trials, even phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and phase one, where is the maximum risk? Because generally it is done on healthy people. Sometimes it is even done on uh, people who have the disease for which they are finding the drug. But even they will be taking the risk on these deemed approval where the regulator has not looked, has not scrutinized it, has not done the due diligence, has not looked whether this particular, whether there are, uh, uh, you know, preclinical studies in it or not, what has been the earlier studies, what are the studies abroad on it or not, none of this due diligence will come up and this would really be problematic if they pass it, uh, you know, uh, and not really look at it properly. So this, this is a real issue that we are facing. Another issue is that they are looking uh, at injury and generally what happens, the assessment that is done by the principal investigator or even the ethics committees is what is physical injury, okay? But health is not only about physical injury. Health is about your physical, mental, social, economic, all of that. But who is assessing it? Who has the capacity to assess it? All that is looked at is medical injury. Nobody is looking at the mental trauma that the participant may have had to go through because of that injury. Nobody is looking at what are the social circumstances and how they have changed for this participant. And that is primarily because the participant is not involved in this assessment. And also there is no one assessing it. Even the ethics committees are not ass assessing it. Even though the ICMR guidelines 2017 require that you look at injury as physical, mental, social injury, but nobody is looking at it that way. At least I have not come across it. And I don't even know if any compensation is paid based on those kind of injuries. And what is the assessment being done uh, as far as those kind of injuries are concerned? And uh, therefore, if you want justice, if you want, you know, the four cardinal principles of uh, clinical trials is autonomy, non-maleficence, uh, beneficence, and justice. If you want all of that, you need to involve the participant in the entire trial process. 
okay only then can it be just in the entire not only the trial process the assessment of the injuries the uh, the compensation that you will give etc now even if we have to talk about compensation there are problems there okay we uh, we are one of the few countries who have a formula actually for compensation uh, and that formula is applicable in certain kind of injuries uh, in case of death or in case of uh, permanent uh, uh, injury uh, there is a certain formula and uh, for all other kinds of injuries there is another formula of course it is based on the workmen compensation act uh, where uh, the, uh, you know they have a table and it's age related and of course it is even as per the risk uh, but the problem with that is is again this whole causality thing the problem is also as to how are you calculating these injuries and again it looks only at physical injury and it looks at in, in and you know if you uh, if you look at the formula also uh, it looks at uh, you know an unskilled person's uh, wage uh, in the city of delhi okay it doesn't uh, even take into account the entire country as a whole and a lot of things uh, you know a lot of things are happening very delhi centric or very uh, you know no you're not even looking at how things play out in other parts of the uh, parts of the country and how uh, vulnerability of participants are in different and there are so many examples in india you know even the hpv vaccine trials which most of you all must be aware of uh, where they went to the tribal areas and the remote areas and uh, and they uh, did a phase 4 trial over there and uh, when the girls died uh, and it became a very big issue and a lot of women's groups and uh, who took up the issue uh, so those cases are pending in court yet you know and uh, what do you do so you uh, so your law is not really looking at an inquisitorial system uh, which makes things easier where where if an injury or if something takes place uh, there will be an inquiry by an independent body and there and then they will provide you with a particular compensation but it is moving more towards an adversarial process where you are where you have to move the courts and then you have to pay money to get into to have access to that court system and then wait for years and years and years and uh, justice is not even to be seen anywhere nearby and that again becomes a a very big problem uh, as far as uh, trial participants are uh, are concerned uh, another issue that uh, comes to mind is about the placebo control trials and uh, even though in india as uh, amar rightly said that you know if there is a standard of care uh, then placebo control trials will not be allowed but you know sometimes uh, and this is a question that came to our mind uh, that suppose there are uh, in uh, say in the us or the uk or wherever the originator country the standard of care is another approved drug which is not approved in india and which is not available in india and then they have come with an experimental drug and they want to try and they want to test that experimental drug in india where the standard of care is not another approved drug here they will necessarily do a placebo control trial isn't it here then they will say well we don't have that drug where which is there in the uk or in the, or in us or in any of the developed countries uh, we don't have access to those drugs and so we have to do a placebo control here and so what is happening is that a lot of such trials are coming to india where because we don't have another approved drug where which could be the standard of care these kind of and our law does not provide that well if there is a an approved drug elsewhere in the world then the sponsor should provide that as the second arm of the trial and not have a placebo control trial and i think this uh, this is something that probably we should uh, you know think about and uh, of course it's open to debate uh, and we can look at those things i also wanted to point out uh, one small thing that you know uh, came to uh, light during the the covid pandemic and on in the uh, during the pandemic when uh, everyone was grappling with what is this disease how does it move and what can be the you know what is the possible treatment for it 
and a lot of trials were taking place. And uh, thankfully, ICMR came out with uh, COVID guidelines also on how uh, you know uh, ethics committees are to give approvals. And uh, one of the uh, interesting things that they did mention in those guidelines is that the ethics committee can a priori ask for post-trial access. So that the sponsor asks the PI to have to give post-trial access. So the agreement between the sponsor and the PI should have this provision of post-trial access. Unfortunately, when, when ethics committees ask for such things, uh, they will say, yes, we'll do it, but we cannot submit it. And you know what happened in the COVID era was that the government was involved in most of the trials. Uh, that took place for drugs and vaccines. So it was the government who was the sponsor and the co-sponsor was the manufacturer or the drug company who were uh, conducting these trials. And in fact, the, the government actually uh, rolled out most of these trials. So the agreement between the government of India or ICMR and these uh, manufacturing companies uh, is not made public, though it should be. Because after all, it is public money that the government is putting in these trials. It is through the public money that they are even buying these vaccines and drugs to be provided. So why are these agreements not made public? What are these clauses that they are putting in these agreements, which they need to keep secret? And this is how they are creating a lot of distrust in, in, in their conduct, uh, which is being seen by people. And uh, you know, and there was so much pressure at that time, especially I'm, I'm talking about May, around May or April, May 2020. Uh, there was so much pressure on ethics committees to, uh, to you know, give approval for, uh, for COVID uh, related uh, trials. Uh, and uh, it, there was pressure not only from the drug companies, there was pressure from the government, there was pressure from the, uh, from the local task force of the government. Uh, to give approvals. And uh, in fact, uh, we were forced to give approvals within two hours, you know, where your ethics committees are not even given enough time to read uh, the documents properly. And they, uh, you know, you want the approval. Okay, you got the approval. And then what happens? I mean, have you got your DSMB board? Who are the members of your DSMB board? Do you have a statistic statistician on that board? And uh, in fact, there was one trial where the statistician was not there. The DSMB boards are actually uh, set up by the sponsor, but they are supposed to be independent. But if the members of the sponsor are only part of the DSMB board, then obviously there is conflict. Obviously, they are going to say, uh -huh, the drug is very good, the drug is very good, let's, you know, and push for it. But there is no independence over there. The third thing was that what was the design of these trials? Everyone were, were at that time, most, most people who were getting hospitalized with COVID were given almost four to five kinds of medicines. They were giving antibiotics, anti-malarials, antivirals, anti-infectives. They were given steroids. And then on top of it, they were given this trial drug, whatever it is. And then if both arms are doing well, and in one arm, two people have died, and one arm, one person has died, they'll say, no, no, trial drug is very good. What is the assessment? How have you done the assessment? What was the trial design? Have you looked at all these things? And where is the accountability in all this? So you have given emergency approval. And then subsequently, you have found that these drugs are not working. In fact, all the drugs that they had listed earlier, all of them were found to be not effective later on as, as the trials and as the phase three ended and when they analyzed the data. But where is the... I understand in an emergency situation, okay, you can look at certain things, but anyways, there is no accountability at all. It's not there in the law. It's not anywhere. There is no transparency. Even when we uh, we have sent RTIs and we've asked who are the members of the, uh, you know, of the SEC, what are their qualifications? What are their affiliations? we have got no answers. You say, look, everything is in the public domain, but if you go to CDSO website, nothing is available there. Their names, their, uh, their qualifications, affiliations, nothing is there. Who is the, uh, uh, for the adverse uh, events that, uh, you know, the adverse events that have taken place post-vaccination, who are the members who are looking at that? No information. 
So transparency and all this is a very important thing. I'll just wind up. Uh, uh, just uh, one or two points that uh, Amar very rightly mentioned that uh, later on when these drugs get patents, then they become inaccessible to everyone. And uh, here is a huge problem of the patent law and how you know patents are actually causing inaccessible uh, uh, drugs and unaffordable drugs also because uh, the drugs are so expensive. All these vaccines, I mean, they may say thousand rupees, two thousand rupees, but they are just not affordable. Uh, and this, so we are talking about COVID era. If you look at you know the other drugs which are non-COVID related, the cancer medications, they are so expensive but our laws are not really helping or even if our law is good uh, you know the will of the government to make a change is not there the will to 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 look at the rights of the people to look at the health of the people holistically to help them uh, is not there it is more about helping the rich who are anyway getting richer and and the pharma companies who have who have made billions and trillions uh, in this COVID uh, pandemic, and they continue to do so. And even, I mean, by their own statistics, uh, let's talk about, like Dhwani spoke about COVID shield and co-vaccine. Uh, let's talk about the adverse events that are the government record. First of all, they didn't even do a follow-up that they were supposed to do for 30 days. There is no accountability for that. Then the adverse events that took place, even if they say there were just a 0.1% or 0.05% adverse events took place, why can't you just give them the compensation? They are saying only one case was related. The rest were all not related. We so would appreciate if you could wind up quickly. Right? So I'm winding up now. I'm sorry I took extra time. No problem. Uh, okay. Take a minute and wind up. Take a minute and wind up if you want to, if you want to conclude something. No, uh, it's okay. Uh, it's, uh, I think that these are very important issues and we need to look at uh, you know, things from a rights-based approach. And even the law that comes about, if, if they are planning to change the law, it should be based on the rights of the people. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the main point I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very lucidly put, and I fully agree with you on the rights approach. Uh, Professor Arjun Saab, uh, do we go around with the next round, or do we? Is there anybody else you uh, want to bring in? No, sir. Please proceed. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what I recommend is we can do um, a round of questions that are there from some of the audience people, and uh, and then maybe give some concluding remarks for each of the uh, uh, panelists and the keynote speakers. So, very uh, important to understand that from the keynote speaker and all the panelists, we've had a comprehensive panoply of almost all the ethical issues that, uh, you know, can be touched upon in clinical trials and therefore this has been a very fruitful discussion in that regard. So the questions, uh, one of the questions is from Nagamani Rao. Your presentation brings out many worrying aspects about clinical trials. Can you throw light about what the health rights movement has been doing to address these concerns and what has been the response of medical establishment to the state to, and the state to these efforts? Since it's not addressed to anybody in particular, I will uh, allocate it to Veena. Now, would you please respond? I think Amar should respond. He's the right person. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, Ravi, do you want me to, uh, you know, uh, take, because I, I noted down all the uh, chat uh, questions that have come. Okay. Uh, they take are them. Uh, in certain categories and I think some points made by the, by the panelists also. Just two, three major points. Can I just Take all of them, including the one that you have made, you have read yeah. out. Okay, go ahead. See, I think there are there are two areas of which one area that I I did not cover. I had my slides, but I I thought I will run out of time, so I took them out. It was about uh, how the regulatory mechanism is functioning, and that's where uh, ethics committee and the CDSCO, the Central Drug Standard Control Organization, comes, and a lot of points are uh, related to that. The first part is, uh, I think Dr. Dhwani also said, and there is a, a chat uh, question also about what happens to the non-medical people who are sitting on the ethics committee. Do they understand what uh, research that they are reading and uh, approving? Mm -hmm. I think this is a very, very important uh, issue. And I, it, it has uh, not been coming up simply because those people in the ethics committee are not asserting themselves. Actually, I haven't been practicing medicine 
since I finished my medical education. So I, I am also more or less a lay person. When I read a highly jargonized uh, protocol, I, I hardly understand. Not only that, when I interact with the researcher, they are very arrogant and they tell me that since you, you are not practicing medicine, you don't understand anything. And that, that really creates problem for the people who don't have medical background sitting in the ethics committee. I think that's where they need to assert. There has to be a, a secretariat of the ethics committee, which makes it mandatory for the company and the researchers to provide a lay person's uh, writing on the, on, on, on the proposal. And, it, uh, and, and, and the secretary should be able to verify that it is not distorting the, the scientific content. I think that uh, should uh, help uh, lawyers and social scientists and lay people and philosophers who sit on the ethics committee. That is very, very important. The second part of the ethics committee, I'm just responding to the points which have come, is uh, what Veena was talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the principal investigator giving suggestions, giving a, a report to the ethics committee saying that whether a particular serious adverse event is related or not. And here I believe uh, the earlier proposals that I made saying that uh, there sh should be separation between the physician who cares for the patient and the, the principal investigator who does the research. And this report should not come from the PI because P principal investigator has a conflict of interest there. So the treating physician who is separate from the principal investigator, who should be making the report? And in the process of doing it, there should be full clinical data, which person has, the doctor has collected by interacting with the patient or the patient relatives should be provided. And the ethics committee should not take it into consideration without having some interaction with the patient or the patient's relationship. I think that is a very, very important. And I have found that most of the ethics committees don't have time to interact with the patient because they, they, they are very time constrained. Large number of proposals, I have set an ethics committee in three hours, we are supposed to clear 30 projects, you know, and that 30 uh, agenda items. And that's very, very difficult. And I think that's where uh, we need to have uh, some reforms where, uh, if not full ethics committee, a subcommittee of the, uh, uh, of, of the ethics committee should be interacting with them. And uh, then at the, even at the central level where uh, ethics committee sends the suggestion to the CDSCO and his committee saying that, well, whether uh, it is related or not and the uh, quantum of, uh, of uh, uh, compensation to be paid, I think there also patients should have some right to make a presentation of his or her own or their representative. So that is one part. The second part I think we didn't cover was about CDSCO to that extent, but it is very, very important. But I think Dr. Dwani has created uh, the it. She has talked about drugs and control, uh, drugs and cosmetic mechanics architecture. There have been large number of uh, uh, amendment, both in the original law <laughs> as well as in the regulation. Unfortunately, none of them have uh, tried to provide the power to the drug controller to punish those who violate. They have done uh, all other kind of uh, uh, you know amendment, but not this one. And when we are talking about it, they want to rewrite. I don't know whether they will really give that kind of power. And today, the whole government is more in, in, in favor of private sector and facilitating the job. I'm not sure that will happen if they are not done, unless there is a strong pressure from below. The, the simple thing that is required is that Drug Controller General of uh, India should be given a status of secretary to the, to the health ministry. You know, we have, we have an ICMR chief who is the secretary of the Department of Health Research. But uh, uh, G D the CGI is under uh, uh, DGHS, Director General of Health Service. He's even, uh, he, he, and DGHS has a, has, a, has a departmental secretary's uh, position, but not, the, no, not, the, the, not the, the, the CGI. If we are really serious, then we must put them at the higher level and make them accountable. Today, they are under the thumb of the DGHS, who has no idea oftentimes about what clinical trials are. So there are uh, uh, these uh, problems, and unless uh, they are uh, 
taken out, they will not work. Nagmani Rao has said that uh, what health uh, rights activists can do, I can tell you they have done a lot and they can do a lot. You know, from 2005, when the Indian uh, clinical trial laws were uh, liberalized, and there were a large number of reports in the press saying that uh, there were uh, unethical clinical trials being conducted and people were dying and they were not getting compensation. Who, re- who led that uh, agitation? There were people who were coming from the you know, health rights uh, NGOs. They were and not the ethics committees of uh, different institutions. Actually, we should expect that ethics committee will, will act as advocate of the patients, but they did not. They just remained where they, at the institutional level. They never took it up with the policy makers saying that we need to tighten the drug, uh, you know, drug regulation. That drug regulation tightening took place when the human rights NGO, the health human rights NGOs went to the Supreme Court brought pressure as well as worked in the media and agitated in order to get it done. So I, 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 I believe that uh, they have a lot uh, a role to play if they also take it up now in this new phase uh, to, to make changes in the, in, in, in the clinical trials related uh, stuff. This is one question says that there is covaxin is a chim. No, it is not. The CHIM is a controlled human infection model for this. And that is only one clinical trial has been carried out using CHIM is in the Oxford in UK. We still don't have enough information about it. It's a very controversial uh, subject. Uh, I don't know um, uh, full information, so I won't say it. But uh, personally, I believe that uh, if you don't have uh, capacity to or, or, or know-how to treat a disease, then you should not infect a person with the disease. To do that is a problem. I think Dr. Uh, Advocate Veena will say that infecting a person itself is causing harm, and so that should never be done. Well, even if I make a concession to, 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 to the, those researchers, then I can say the minimum that is required is that uh, don't go into this unless you have a treatment, a proper treatment, and uh, you have used an um, organism which is attenuated to such an extent that it will not uh, cause culminating disease. Now, what was done in uh, Oxford, there is one paper has come out on pathogenesis, but nothing more than that is heard of. We have not seen the seen, uh, um, its uh, um, you know, protocol, so I cannot tell you uh, what exactly uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, what exactly uh, has happened in the team trial. And last thing is about Mala. You have done a great job, but uh, I think perhaps we need to pay more attention to the clinical trials in India. And in India, uh, you know, they, the, the, the vulnerable people don't have as strong agency as uh, elsewhere. And so oftentimes our researchers are happy to recruit vulnerable people rather than non-vulnerable people, and that includes women. So thalidomide uh, did certain things that there, but in India, they perhaps may be going for more women. Pregnancy issue is definitely there, and uh, uh, pregnant women they will not take, but otherwise, uh, um, uh, in India, not using women is, uh, is not going to be as a strong point. What is most, most important, as you have made out and uh, argued, that uh, disaggregation of data, providing group uh, you know, analysis, uh, sub, subgroup analysis, on the base of gender and sex is very, very important, as well as uh, with other vulnerabilities is very important. But the problem we are having is a general problem, which is not even solved. The data are never made public when the clinical trials are done in India. Forget about gender analysis. The, the CTRI, the, the clinical trial registry, does not give even uh, bare findings of the trial. Forget about giving data of the trial, you know, which ICMR has signed uh, several times in the international statement saying that yes they will be doing it but they still haven't done it so we are in a very preliminary stage but uh, when we talk about it and we make them to release data then we have to see that data related to all the vulnerabilities gender vulnerabilities sexual vulnerabilities the vulnerabilities related to the caste and and and, and others they all are taken into consideration and the data are made available
So I'll just stop here. And uh, if anybody else has anything, can uh, can continue. Dr. Vaswani, I would like to add my two bit to what Amar has just now said. We are most willing to accept your two bits, 20 bits, 200 bits. Yeah. So actually, Amar, when we say that women are particularly vulnerable and they are not included, they, I mean, we need... It doesn't mean running a protection racket. It actually means taking a bit more time, being conscious of the con cultural, social context. And if required, you know, extending the time required for making them understand, Ex enabling their participation rather than systematically excluding them from participation or default mode as no need women because uh, they don't obey the standard format of the male body, you know, physiologically. And that is what I'm arguing against. I'm not saying we need to suddenly now include all women. But what I'm saying is, whatever you do, give us a rationale for that. Uh, Mala, there, Mala, Mala, there is another thing coming in the tribal after the HPV vaccine uh, controversy. The government is uh, trying to create more and more hurdles to the participation of tribal people in the clinical trial. It is doing so all that, kinds I, of I mean, uh, it is hurdles are not related to their benefit or not, which is a, which we should be there, that uh, you cannot do clinical trial on speaking vulnerable people unless they have a... Yeah. But it's a paternalistic... No, it's a bureaucratic also, that you have to go to the district level tribal officer to get permission for yes. doing a clinical trial or doing any research on the tribe. Yes. Now, that those are the people who are bureaucrats who have no understanding of research. And that's what uh, they, 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 uh, they, are, they are doing. The, that is more protectionism. Yes. Uh, you know, As that has come done, about. So it yeah. becomes yeah. far more protect. Uh, that's what I said. Paternalizing and protectionism. And uh, that is where uh, you have to look at the other question that has emerged. What are the rights violations from a reproductive perspective? The, it is a violation when we can say, you know, when the treatment action group could come forward and say that we have a right to participate and we respect that. Then pregnant women have a right to treatment. Lactating women have a right to treatment. Women have a right for research to be done on them so that the treating medications consequences is known to the treating physicians and they are not groping in the dark only by, you know, learning by trial and error. And Very that true. is why. And it is by trial and error. By and large, if the evidence has not been created and that is not, and Dr. Vaswani can tell me how many clinicians are even aware of the gender composition of the original clinical trials which actually inform their decision making on medication that they prescribe for their patients. Absolutely. So it's based on faith. Absolutely. We call it a science. And that is precisely why I would say that it is also the rights of women, their reproductive and other, you know, human rights, as Dr. Jauri is talking, as Advocate Jauri is talking about, to have evidence created through them, for them. So, you know, you yes, it's India and women are going to be taken for a ride, but that does not mean they are taken for a ride even otherwise. Thank you, Mala. We'll move on to uh, a further. So, Veena, would you like to counter any comments to uh, what Amar made and on, the, on the human rights part or would you like us to move on? Uh I think we can move on, but just to add to what Amar was talking about, uh, you know, the CHIM trials, uh, I think there is a, uh, there is a guideline, a WHO guideline that, uh, that actually says that for infectious diseases, uh, you know, uh, especially in an endemic or pandemic situation, you should not be doing CHIM trials, uh, challenge studies. And, uh, and as Amar rightly pointed out that, uh, you know, for a disease where you don't even understand the disease uh, completely. 
and you don't even have a treatment for it, uh, forget a cure for it, uh, a, a CHIM trial definitely should not take place. And in India, there are multiple other challenges also, apart from, uh, you know, just this particular aspect of uh, just how healthcare is here. And, uh, you know, what is the accessibility and what are the facilities available, et cetera, and the vulnerability. And as Dhwani said, you know, very rightly said, he, I was so induced to, to take up, to enter the trial just for the money. And, and we know that, that that is really what happens, that uh, it's not really altruistic. It is, uh, you know, it, it, there are financial considerations uh, and economic considerations that people look at. Yeah. Very true. Thank you. And Vani, I want to bring you in on the next question. It's from uh, S. Kantesh. Can panelists give insight about the relevance of people's participation in knowledge generation and medical research in enhancing the benefits of research and minimizing risk? In the UK, currently, there is a movement about uh, people and public, uh, patient and public involvement and engagement in research. So, would you like to answer this? Um, sure. I mean, it's. I, I think this speaks to, you know, uh, a point I was making in my talk when I said how important it is for people from different disciplines to be able to talk to each other. And I suppose that translates into... Um, science being able to talk to people uh, and in, in, in some sense that's only going to happen if people understand what is what is being researched what what their stake is in it uh, how they can uh, benefit from it and I, I mean I don't see that happening to uh, you know in, in any kind of systematic way uh, currently uh, you know so at least I, I, I mean I think we have strong advocacy movements and you know the work that everyone here on this panel is doing the focuses a lot on protecting the right to health of uh, you know uh, people and involving them in advocacy and activism around guaranteeing access to that that right but some sometimes somehow I, I don't think that always translates into people having a stake in the technical and scientific knowledge production that you know that that that, that should be happening and that uh, that that ultimately benefits them so you you know we don't it's not a matter of common discourse for people to ask oh well why are there so many uh, drugs for uh, you know uh, cancer and uh, heart disease but not enough for rare tropical diseases so this is not something that enters the the popular uh, parlance uh, and i i mean i'm not entirely sure what I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I have a ready solution for how, uh, you know, uh, people's participation in, in knowledge generation and medical research should be improved. I mean, in one sense, people's participation is there to a very real extent by being participants in clinical trials. But what we're talking here, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing what the, the question here is talking about is, you know, more about how do we get people to be invested in the kind of research, um, yeah. research that is done. And Driving the direction of research. Yeah, and perhaps something like that, you know, has its sh should begin at, uh, you know, at the student level, at universities um, that that are able to, in you know, uh, do outreach and encourage this kind of, uh, you know, public discourse within the community about uh, about knowledge generation, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know, I I mean, we I don't know enough about this, and I wish I could have spoken a little more, but there's obviously you know the regime under the Biological Diversity Act, which protects traditional knowledge and uh, which currently, you know, is, is, is facing a lot of, um, I mean, there, there, there have been amendments that have proposed that might dilute the way in which people have ownership about traditional forms of uh, knowledge or, you know, indigenous knowledge production. And perhaps that is another area where there is scope. I mean, there's a whole architecture again under that act to be able to involve uh, the community in, uh, in you know in in owning its uh, its knowledge, but with the I mean, as it is the pattern with a lot of legislation in India, I mean it's it it exists on paper, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make that uh, uh, a reality in practice. I guess it was earlier on in India very well known as community engagement, but now it's got a new uh, sobriquet right. Right. about patient and public involvement and engagement. Okay, thank right. you so much. Mala, the next question goes to you. What are, what are the salient features of ethical standards with regards to reproductive rights of women? I thought I answered that when I made that Okay, okay I'm so sorry. Did I, did I miss yeah. the answer for that? Vibhuti, are you okay with uh, what Mala said? So, or shall we go? You want any more clarification? 
Can you unmute yourself, please? Unmute. Vibhuti, you can't be... I wrote it half an hour back. She has taken it. She okay. has answered that. Mala okay. has answered that. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is uh, an open question. Number uh, several false articles were published in reputable medical journals. This situation has led to loss of trust. Your response, please. <laughs> During COVID time and uh, otherwise also, uh, there was a fraud in this such uh, hydroxychloroquine articles published in uh, Lancet and then they uh, were retracted. But then the, that is also happening uh, what is in, in, in on the portals, which are called pre-print portals, where articles without peer reviews are published, and quite a few of them have been retracted. So yes, uh, uh, they, they, there are uh, uh, frauds there. I can say as a say, editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics that from April 2020, uh, when the, uh, when the uh, pandemic was de uh, declared in India, the number of article submissions almost doubled. And that was true for most of the medical journals. Everybody was writing and everybody wanted to publish uh, at the earliest. And uh, even those who were doing systematic research, they wanted uh, uh, you know, the halfback data to be published uh, as early as possible so that they can be used uh, uh, to fight the pandemic. So some of that was a uh, good intention, but uh, that was bringing a very uh, uh, bad uh, you know, outcome uh, as far as uh, uh, knowledge was concerned. I would uh, you know, be more worried uh, uh, with what I showed in my slide that most of these clinical trial articles which are published in medical journals are uh, ghost written, you know. You'll find that even uh, uh, the, the articles on the trials done for, on the COVID-related issues, therapeutic trials as well as uh, uh, vaccine trials, their data were controlled by the companies and they had their own writers, and there are diff there are CROs, the contract research organization, whose job is to do data analysis and the scientific writing. And there are communication CROs whose job is to place in the right kind of high impact journal. And uh, they contact uh, professors in the universities to give their name to the papers. And you will find that when you read the, the fine print of the, the articles about uh, what data actually the authors uh, who are well-known professor had seen, you will find that they're seen a very, very partial data uh, there. So when uh, a clinical trial is done, that's why I asked that clinical trial reports which are submitted to the <coughs> drug controller should be made public. <coughs> that contains data. That contains data running in Amar, your voice is breaking. We lost you for some time. I think we'll come back, hopefully. Amar, we can't hear you. We can't, your screen also is frozen. The, uh, to the uh, regulator, they are not made public so that for other people to look at. So this is a, a major problem in, uh, in, in, the, in the medical journal. The medical journals make a huge amount of money from that. The reprint of uh, a paper which is based on clinical trial, give them hundreds of thousands of dollars just selling that price. And that's how the publishing uh, corporates, Elsevier, uh, Wiley, the Taylor and Francis and all, they control almost 70% of all the medical journals. Four of Absolutely. them Absolutely. control 70%. And uh, their profit margin is higher than the profit margin of the Apple, you know, the, 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 the most uh, expensive uh, computer maker. This is uh, the situation. So yes, what you are saying is, uh, is that uh, it's not only fraud, but it's also... Oh, your internet connection is unstable. We're losing you. I will quickly. complete that sentence if you will allow me to... Yes, sure, Mala, go ahead. With great pleasure. It's also indicative of collusion. Absolutely. Which is act actually our lawyer friends like Dr. Ms. Dwani and uh, Mehta and uh, Dr. Advocate Jory will tell us that that is indicative of a cartel. Absolutely. Makes sense. And uh, that actually, not just Apple, most of our, you know, philanthropic, which we call fundamentalism of philanthropy, 
the investment of knowledge production the returns are far higher than the drug produced itself from publishing so you can think of the returns on knowledge production and why that needs to be controlled in continuation with the comments from amar and mala i would like to inform our audience and listeners that they got into this good book by carl elliot called white coat black hat and it kind of resonates exactly with what uh, both of them are saying right now about the ghost writing and the cartel and the nexus very nicely written book and it's from personal experience and so uh, it's a book that i would recommend to everybody to read okay um i think we just want to rewind up now so we'll give a round of uh, concluding remarks to each of the uh, speakers i think we've lost amar for some time hopefully he'll come back um in case he doesn't let's start with uh, dhani um, some concluding remarks from your side Ah, Amar has come to Vibhuti's. Uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> so let's give uh, Amar the mic. Amar, uh, concluding remarks in just two or three minutes, briefly. Okay, Amar is trying to look around for the jack for the mic. I don't think he heard us. I don't think he heard your remarks. Though. I'll repeat. Amar, you're with us now. Can you hear me? No, I finish. Uh, I think uh, that is the only thing I wanted to say. Uh, no, we want to now. Yeah, we will be Mala. Thankfully, finished for you on behalf of that. And now we're moving on to concluding remarks from each of the panelists. So, okay. like a couple of minutes for concluding remarks. Me, uh, keep you me start. the last. Uh, get me last. I just okay. Uh, okay. Let's, all right. Let Dhani start then. <laughs> uh sure um i think we've already covered quite a wide range of topics um so i'm not i'm not entirely sure on what note to end except that perhaps uh, maybe we should think about um you know ensuring that medical curricula and maybe other curricula as well are able to uh understand what some of the ethical challenges with i mean clinical trials is narrow but i mean i guess broadly i'm you know i'm saying that uh bioethics and in in general should should probably become uh a more a part of the you know a mainstream discourse and maybe one way to do that is 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 by making is by changing curriculum uh cur curricula at, at the undergraduate level so uh that's that's one idea that i uh you know have in mind because i i, I feel that sometimes these conversations that we have happen with you know the familiar faces the same kinds of people and there's the scope for us to get a wider audience uh, interested in this i mean of course the igme is doing fantastic work uh, in 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 that space um, but you know there's there's possibly the scope to take that to a much uh, larger scale so i hope that this i mean this lecture is the starting point for you know having wider conversations like this and i hope that, this, uh, hope that you know I, again the pandemic has always seemed like a good starting point for many new things and maybe the, it's also shown us that there are so many different kinds of ethical issues that we have to wrestle with uh, Uh, on a daily basis and hopefully we'll be able to equip our future generations to think about these in a more sensitive uh, manner i think you would have brought a very important point about bioethics education and the curriculum changes that need to happen thank you so much for bringing in that point uh veena would you like to take up the next queue for the next couple of minutes thanks uh, and uh, very interesting discussions that we've had uh i would like to conclude by just three points i think we need to have transparency in everything transparency of who's doing what uh, the data data transparency who are the people deciding things what are where is the government money putting its money uh, what is the nexus between the government and the industry what is the nexus between the uh the principal investigator institutions etc there has to be what are the conflicts of interest transparency is very important involvement of participants in the entire clinical trial uh, regime is very important in involvement not just to participate uh and take a drug uh that may be beneficial or take the maximum risk but also involvement in every process of it and also a system of allowing them to appeal if they are not happy with the decision of the ethics committee or the authority and uh, the third 
is on compensation. I think we have a law, but it is not really implemented. And there is a lot of scope of improvement there. And I think compensation is a very important aspect uh, for the participants. And I think it should be that causality thing is such a blur and such a area where you can really, you can find your way around the way you want it. But if, if the number of people who are getting an adverse or a serious adverse event are minuscule, you give them the compensation, give them a no fault compensation, which could be a lump sum amount or assess it and give them a substantial amount, but have a, a transparent process to do the same. It's my take. Thank you. Oh, brief concluding remarks, but with huge implications. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mala, please go ahead. I don't have too much to say. I've said quite a bit already by way of concluding. And um, I agree with what has already been said because the major roadblock is the lack of understanding. And I'd like to add that the jargon in clinical trial documents is not understood by fellow clinicians if it is highly specialized. And therefore, I have had, you know, senior clinicians from one division asking for clarifications and therefore wanting to read the lay documentation on that and insisting on it is very important, I think, in submissions. The second one is the need to educate, 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 not just merely at medical education level, but continue to inform because we learned you know, I sit in ethics committees and actually ran an ethics committee as a member secretary. I learned a lot from reading the transcripts of the various cases filed in the Supreme Court. And believe it or not, the standing committee, parliamentary standing committee, which stood up and asked questions yeah. to these very authorities. That was like a who done it. So there are mechanisms in this country, but we don't, we live in silos and we don't seem to talk. We need more forums like this to actually, you know, enable that translatory skill. You know, we don't have it. For instance, I'm a statistician and I don't talk to normal people because I don't know how to explain. But I need to acquire that skill. And, and that is something which we all, you know, and advocates, have not, not, you know, legal advocates, advocates for patients in, teach us so much more. And we need to engage with those people who are in the forefront of us for want of a better metaphor battles, literally. Because they're battling on multiple grounds, a caucasus that is building. So, I mean, those are very good points we need to yeah. work on. Yeah, thank you so much. Huh. Amar, yeah, a yeah, couple, couple of uh, quick points. Uh, Ravi, you know very well that... Uh, uh, as a clinician, when uh, people talk about ethics, the first thing that comes to your mind is the, the your counterpart, the patient, isn't it? To, to be ethical means to, to be very sensitive, compassionate, to understand what the other side uh, is feeling. So I completely go with what Vani has said. You require uh, people there because if you are doing clinical trials for the betterment of the society, then uh, not to get people involved in the clinical trial process is criminal because that, that means only, uh, you know, it's a kind of a utopian society where, the, where, where, the, where, where all these, uh, you know, uh, corporates and the experts decide and, uh, and not people, you know. Dystopian, and, not utopian. That's why uh, we, we came uh, in ethics committees uh, one step forward. We started with having chairperson from outside and the rest of the member came in from, from the institution or from out. And now we realize that by having a lot of people from the institution, they just do nothing. You know, they can't question uh, the kind of clinical trial that is being done. So we say now, okay, 50% of the people you bring from outside. I think we need to take a second step where you say that the majority of the people who are sitting in the ethics committee should be non-medical people, you know, from the society. And I'll tell you, a the couple of people who are sitting at the moment, they are, they are getting bullied. You know, they hardly open their mouth. But if they are majority, 
I hope they will start opening their mouth. There may be a journalist, there may be a social scientist, there may be economists. Let them sit there. Let there be, you know, people's gaze over the medical profession and the science. Because that is which will make uh, them accountable. So when uh, we can't talk in uh, abstract about people, you know, coming in the street and protesting on clinical trial, that is not going to happen. What is going to happen is a systematic participation and uh, strengthening of their position in the, in the process of the clinical trial, that may bring about some accountability. It may not be fully great, but it's, it, will, it will change the situation. I think that was done uh, after a big uh, uh, crisis in uh, New Zealand in late 1980s, when the, they did the carcinoma cervix trial, where uh, a, a judge, a woman judge of the, of the, uh, of the court, who did the inquiry of the unethical clinical trial. And one of the outcome was that they started having large number of non-medical people on the, on the ethics committee. And that made uh, for some, some transparency. My second point is, uh, I come back to the regulator. The ethics committee is a regulation, same with the, the, the national level regulator. And uh, in India, somehow or other, uh, we don't understand what is mean by com conflict of interest. Actually, we believe that unless we have conflict of interest, we cannot get our things done in the government, in the market, and everywhere. So you have to keep your leg in everything. You know that is a that is a kind of a, a belief system that that we come from, and the regulator getting controlled by the regulator is the major problem. How do you make CDSCO, the regulator, um, uh, independent? I think that should be one of the major consideration in any revision that uh, that we carry out. Absolutely. In America and everywhere, what is happening is a kind of a revolving door. If you are a CEO of a pharmaceutical company today, after two years, you just come step down from that and become the chief of the reg drug regulator. This is what is happening today. You don't have an independent cadre which is not connected to the industry to do the regulatory work. It's a is the, you look savvy, you look at most of the regulatory regimes in <laughs> India, they come from the same industry that they are supposed to regulate. regulate. How, is, how, how, are, how, how strongly they are going to regulate it? It is more of a business regulation that they are doing, rather than regulation in order to protect the interests of the people in that particular industry. And in the clinical trial industry, it is protecting the participants, the society and the science. Science is also very important. Fraud in science is really very, very bad for the science itself. So we have to keep that in mind. And uh, you know, the latest proposal that the government has come out with, they said that, well, we are going to consider deem approval if uh, within certain weeks, the regulator does not give Reply. clearance to a clinical trial or to the drug. Now, this should be, analyze in relationship with uh, CDSCO's capacity to do actually the review and the take decision on time. If you read parliamentary standing committee report on CDSCO, what you will find is that large number of senior positions are lying vacant. They are not able to recruit really good, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, good uh, uh, expert in the, in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical to, to, to be sitting there. And uh, most of the subject expert committee members are also taking a lot of projects from the, from the pharmaceutical company. And, uh, so in that situation, if you have a deem clearance, deem approval, that means uh, what you are saying is that in most of the cases, the regulator will not have capacity to handle so many applications. And so most of the application will become approved without any kind of even bureaucratic gaze or expert gaze. Forget about people's gaze, you know, or the, or the, or the, or the non-medical people's gaze. They, 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 they're looking at it. So these kind of proposals are emanating. And that makes me very, very pessimistic that when the law is rewritten, will it be rewritten in the favor of people or will it be rewritten in the favor of uh, companies Industry. which are doing research. The easiest and the most uh, effective way would be 
not to allow companies which are going to make profit by producing the new drug to do the clinical trials. You should have a public authority doing the clinical trial. If the companies have money, take the money from them. Put it in a common kitty at the, pub, at, at, at the public level, which is uh, managed by managed publicly by the representatives of the uh, you know, people. And then give, give the projects to do clinical trials to the independent researchers in the institution without company directly involved there. Why can't that system be created in India so that uh, there is no company directly involved doing the research? I think uh, there is a major conflict of interest at the very origin of the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. But the clinical trial is conducted by, this, by somebody who wants to benefit from the outcome of the clinical trial by marketing the drug. So I think uh, there is a lot of work to be carried out and sometimes it looks very overwhelming because it is not a very popular subject. It is a subject of a few experts, like, you know, few of us who are sitting here and uh, some 25, 30 people who are listening to us. So it's, uh, it's not a, it's a big, uh, it doesn't have a big popular following, but uh, it is an important area <laughs> and I hope uh, more people will take interest and uh, do something about it. Yeah. yeah Ravi. It's a very important point, Amar. Uh, it reminds me of the Latin phrase, uh, Key custodian episodes, custodies, who will guard the guards? So we need regulators to regulate the regulators, and then we need regulators to regulate those regulators, and so on. But it's a very important point you have raised because without that, uh, there is no um, accountability on behalf of the regulators, and they can be very high handed and you know behave in whichever way they want to. So, on that very nice, uh, though depressing note, uh, we would like to um, conclude this panel discussion, and I thank the keynote speaker and the panelists, they've been wonderful. You had a very rich and enthralling discussion. And I thank Impri once again, Professor Arjun Kumar Saab, over to you. Ah, uh, thank you. So to give a formal vote of thanks, now I invite Anshula. Um, thank you. As we come to the end of this very enlightening discussion, I, Anshula Mehta, Senior Assistant Director at Impri, would like to propose a formal vote of thanks. On behalf of the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development, I thank our speaker, Dr. Amar Jasani, for taking out the time to be with us and for delivering um, this special lecture on the very important topic of ethical challenges in clinical trials with a focus on drug and vaccine trials. Thank you, sir. We are grateful to our chair, Professor Ravi Vaswani, for accepting our invitation and for steering the discussion so wonderfully and enriching the deliberation with his insights. Thank you, sir. We thank our discussants, Dr. Dhwani Mehta, Professor Mala Ramanathan, and Advocate Meena Jauri for sharing their perspectives and analyses and uh, giving way to such a thought-provoking and engaging discussion. Thank you. And lastly, we are grateful to all our attendees who joined us here on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live or would be watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our podcasts. Thank you for joining us and for raising such pertinent questions as well. We hope that you continue to tune in to future uh, web policy talks at IMPRI. Um, and we wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks Thank very you. much. And bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye.